Okay, we're in Micah. Did I miss anybody that's got a scripture? Okay, we're, we're in Micah, Micah chapter 2, and we're closing out chapter 2 with these two verses, 12 and 13. And there's been a radical speaking of judgment over people that just absolutely will not bend. That's a dangerous thing. All disobedience becomes sin. It don't matter if it's the preacher or the preacher's wife or the deacon or whoever, the Sunday school teacher. Whenever it gets to where there, it's, it, God spoke to you and you won't do it, that's whenever disobedience stands up. And who, who, who had the scripture? Maybe, maybe it was you, Mia, that had the scripture in uh, James, what is it, 4.17? Uh, if you know to do good and won't do it, and that, that's the problem. If we didn't know, we would be animals. Yeah, but we're not animals. Sometimes we act like animals. I love it when you shout. Like, we don't know. It. <laughs> I go to jail all the time, and, and then, boy, oh, I said, oh, wait a minute now. You, you know, run around that other man's wife ain't right. Whoa! <laughs> I said, you'd have to be an animal not to know that because put, God put in the heart of an individual right and wrong. That's just a knowledge we have. Just like a cat knows to meow, you don't teach them that. A rooster crows because that's put in there by God. A sheep blades, a cow moos, and a horse nickers. All of that come from God. It's just natural. And so naturally from us is the ability of right and wrong. So when we willingly step over it and we know we know what God said and we just go on that uh, abrasive uh, lack of doing God's bidding is what cost us. And so what we want to do is live a life of humility. Lord, my will does not have to be strong. I want my will to be your will. And that, that's the breaking point in relationship. If your will is to follow the will of God, you break self down until, the, until you can conform your will to his. As long as our will is arrogant and sticking up and it's our way or the highway, we're lost as a goose in a snowstorm. You can preach like crazy, you'll still go to hell if you don't do God's will. Yes, yes, it turns into that, into depravity. I don't know if you heard the question, but she said, is that when you have a depraved mind? Yes, when you keep going and just won't bend, that's whenever the, the neck is hard and, the, and, the, and, uh, and there's just that, I don't care what God says, it's basically, you might not say it with your mouth, but your actions are speaking that. And so what we want to do is um, the, the scripture, who, who, had, who had Romans chapter 12 and 2? Yes, right here. That scripture, man, be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. What happens? By the renewing of our mind. So we've got to thank God, and then we allow that thinking to seep down into our heart because we want to be like him. Yeah, and so uh, that, that's a heartbeat. Here, here in this passage, he's talking about in verses 12 and 13, we'll look at those. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. Now, th this is after, you know, you know the scripture, what, what is scripture everybody quotes out of Jeremiah? Is it? Uh, I know said I have three. Yes, 20, 23 what? 33, three. It may be 33, three. I, I, know, I know the thoughts that I have for you, thoughts of good and not of evil. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, if you read above that, that's 70 years before that happens. Israel is just going into, into captivity. And the Lord said, my thoughts have never been what's fixing to happen to you. I've had good thoughts for you, but you would not, you would not hear. And so because of that, there's going to be a 70-year process before you come back to where I can bless you. Because I, he can't bless disobedience. He can't do it. And so... The, the promise here is, is not an immediate promise, but it is a promise that I'm going to gather a remnant back of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. And the noise is that we, we made it back to God. Man, I, I was saved as a, as a young boy and filled with the Holy Ghost when I was eight. In my teenage years, I just started idling off to the side, just crazy. And 
I tried to justify what was going on in my life and everything. I mean, I, I still went to church and all, but I, I didn't live for God. And when the, when the Lord brought me back, it was like the, the greatest load uh, broke down off of me. And, and from then till now, it's like, it's so, it's so wonderful. I don't know if, how, how y'all was raised, but every once in a while, whenever, like during the, I don't know, seventh and eighth and ninth grade, something like that, whenever track would break out, uh, you would, you would, they had some little uh, tennis shoes. I don't remember what they called them now, but they didn't have no heel on them or nothing. They just for running. And each year, mom and dad would, would get us, boys, if we wanted to run track, we, we, we needed a pair of those shoes to run track with. And there's just always, there was always this feeling, you know, that if I get them on, look out. <laughs> well, you know, whenever the Lord gets a hold of you, there, there's that joy that, man, I, I got the weights off of my feet. I mean, I can, I can walk with Christ now. And, and you, you, uh, you start your, your race with Christ to, to stay away from all the old nature. And day by day, you get further and further away from what you was back there. And the joy of, of running in the freedom of knowing that I'm, I, it's been so long since I've been hooked to it. I'm so free. And to, and to keep that up is such a precious thing. So he's talking about here as the flock of the mist, man, making great noise for a reason multitude of men. There's a happiness here whenever the Lord comes to draw them back to their place. There's a scripture in uh, I think it's in Jeremiah. We'll look at it here in just a minute. The breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate. It's like they finally got away from captivity and being lost. They've made it through and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. So it's wonderful to know that as we take our stand with God, guess who goes with us? Right before us. I don't know if you've seen them big snow plows where they got that big old point on them and a, a, a pretty good sized tractor or truck behind them and, and they go down through there and that, that, that snow just goes or just starts making a big old deal and r right where they're at it's just uh, it's cleaned off well that's that's what the Lord does he just passes before us and helps us helps clean off the stuff um, in front of us in, in this scripture in uh, Jeremiah chapter I think it's chapter 6 16 maybe we'll look at, at verse number 14 he's talked about the I don't know the 8 or 10 scriptures above this he's, he's dealing with Israel and you know Jeremiah's a weeping prophet because they haven't went into captivity yet but he knows they're going to because the Lord told him that I want you to talk to them but they're not going to listen to you doesn't that sound like our world you talk, 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 and they say, I don't want to, I don't want what you got. <laughs> I want to listen to you. But we're hoping before Jesus comes that they do get hungry for God. So here, though, is, is the beautiful, beautiful part of the Lord bringing them back. Therefore, behold, the days come. You can tell by the way this is written that this is distant. Saith the Lord that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Up until now, in Israel's life, the whole deal went plumb back to them deliverance from Egyptian bondage. We still talk about it. We even sing about it. How many remembers the song? Anybody? I was once in Egypt's bondage, but deliverance came to me. And I'm living now in Canaan. Cause the sun has set me free. Whoa, I am dwelling now in Canaan. Jesus' blood has avails for, me. avails for me. I'm free from condemnation because the sun has set me free. And so we, we sing about it because that goes back to our leaving sin. It's like the Egypt. But notice what he's saying. This is, this is really neat. He said, the Lord liveth. They're going to say the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel. They're not going to say that no more. They're going to say something else. Look what they're going to say in verse number 15. They're going to say, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north. Now, they've never been in the land of the north. But they're, that's where they're going to go. And I mean, he's prophesying this. This is the early part of uh, Jeremiah's uh, ministry. And he's prophesying 
It's going to come to pass. If you've ever read Lamentation, that's, that's the prophet weeping over Israel that's lost its way and is gone into captivity. It's happened by them. So they're going to be saying, this is, this is 70 years later, but they're going to sing this song here. The Lord liveth that brought the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands, whether he had driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Now, a lot of, in 70 years, there'll be people that was born out of state that's never been to Israel. A lot of the people that knew all the glory of the first house and the first temple, they died while in captivity. And so there's a brand new group, a greater, a greater bunch that's, that comes back 70 years later. And how do they get there? I, I love this. I thought this is so neat. Kind of, I was reading this just the other day. Behold, I will send many fishers. Isn't the Lord neat? Set the Lord and they shall fish them. So he's sending all the fishers out there and they're fishing them out of all those countries. <laughs> and it, and he, what he's doing is he's using this to get us an idea of it. I'm going to bring them back. And so when the fishers get through to what he says, and after will I send many hunters. What do hunters do? They go out there and they try to find the game. Well, look what I'm going to send many hunters. And they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill. And out of the holes of the rocks, wherever they went and hid their self, he said, I'm going to bring them home. In 1948, a great part of that came to pass. Uh, after the World War II and, and all the Jews, uh, the, the concentration camps and the killing of a million plus Jews and all of that, they decided, you know what? There is one place that used to belong to us. It was called Israel. And they, they headed back just boatloads of them headed back across to Israel. And Israel in 1948 become a nation again who had been off the, off the Richter scale for years and years and years. And now there's a bunch of them over there and they just keep following in. You know what? The, the Lord sent them hunters out there and hunting them out of them holes in the rocks. Wow. You know what? He is going to have, he's going to have a remnant. So very, very precious work of the, of the Lord working. I was um, in the jail Sunday, and I, I, I've been telling you about this guy that's kind of real, been crude. He's been in and out of jail several times. He's probably 35, but this time he come with a completely different thought. He's been reading his Bible and praying and talking about the Lord, and uh, last Sunday is the first time he ever read for us, and he, he doesn't read real good, but it, it, he, still, he still wanted to do it. I, I was so proud of him. Anyway, he's been studying out of Jeremiah, and I said, well, have you got to 37 yet? He said, I'm reading it right now. All them bones. The bones is everywhere. And he said that, that prophet started saying, uh, Lord, if you say the bones can live, they can live. So he starts calling the bones together and call flesh on them. Boy, I mean, he stirred up. I said, did you know that that actually happened? That's a prophetic message of Israel being raised back up a great army. If you read on down, it actually tells you in that passage what that's going to be, that Israel's going to become, they've been dead and their bones scattered all over the place, but uh, each bone come back together, the hand bone to the arm bone. Isn't that neat? <laughs> whole deal and he said and he said I looked out there and he said there's, they got the flesh on them and everything but there's no breath in them and he said I said and the Lord told him told the prophet he said speak to the wind he said oh no that's not what he said he said speak to the four winds I said oh you <laughs> you got it <laughs> speak to the four winds and command them winds to come and to breathe life into this nation and right there out of Ezekiel 37 stood up the army that's over there right now fighting, believing God, trusting the Lord, still under the Mosaic law, they don't, they don't understand and brother uh, mm, I think it was uh, uh, yep brother John he said he looked at, you know I, I was telling you about the other day, I think it's in 1 Corinthians uh, 3.12, maybe look it up that, that the veil is still over their face after, after service. He said, I finally found that scripture you was looking for. I said, oh, thank you so much. That's precious. <laughs> but here, here it is just, uh, what, three days late? But here. <laughs> I think it's in 1 Corinthians uh, 3.12, I, I believe. If not, it, it's 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.12. If I hadn't lost it somewhere in my, some, sometimes the file doesn't come up just right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you found it, baby? Okay. 
okay. Yeah, sometimes. Let's see here. My deal was messed up too. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's going to be, it must be Second Corinthians. Okay, it's it's a it's it's thirteen, thirteen. Yeah. Okay, three three twelve says, "Seeing then that that we have such hope, we use red plan as a speech, and look on down to thirteen. We we'll read down through about sixteen. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Second Corinthians. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians three. Uh, yeah, three. Yeah, look at about 14, 2 Corinthians three fourteen. <clears throat> but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Isn't that crazy? That after 2,000 years, they still can't see past their face about New Testament reading. Look, I think it's... Uh, yeah. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the, the veil is upon their heart. And so they have not received Christ yet. They will. The promise is out there uh, that the Lord will will bring them in. Uh, that nation, according to Zechariah, will be saved in one day. When Jesus descends on the, on Mount Carmel and that, that mountain opens up and forms the valley of Megiddo, the people are going to look at him and say, who, who gave you those wounds? They're going to look at his hands, his feet, and he's going to say, my own familiar friend. And they're going to recognize, we killed the Son of God 2,000 years ago. And they're going to accept him. That whole nation is going to recognize Christ as their Savior. Isn't that wonderful that he cares that much, that he's still got his arms out? And, and Rome, Romans talks about it. Um, Romans chapter 11. We're not chasing rabbits, but this is, this is important to look at how, how much the Lord is reaching out because he said he's going to bring the remnant back. Romans chapter 11, and, and look at about verse number 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentile, how much more their fullness. So he's talking about the Jewish nation here that the stump was cut off and we were grafted in in its place. We, we don't have time to read it all, but look, look on down. So he said, how much is going, for us, I, I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I'll magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke the emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some. So he's saying, I really, I want the Jews to come to know Christ as their Savior. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So he says, we're going to bring them back. They've been cast off because they said, let his blood be on us. But he says, I'm coming back for them. Look, look, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So the first fruit of the, of the Jewish race was, when you think of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those men followed God, not perfect, but they, they repented, they lived, they lived for God. And the Lord puts them down as the patriarchs of the, of the Jewish people. The first fruit be holy, and if some of the branches be broken off. So he's saying, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So he says, here we are. They've been broke out. We've been grafted in. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So he says, don't boast against the Jews and say, well, they, they just left their deal. We've, we've had enough trouble in our own life, haven't we? Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And notice this next word. Here's one of the strong uh, judgment scriptures. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. If, if God took that natural branch out and grafted us in, how much more would he take a graft off that said, we don't need God? 
When I look at our nation, America, they, they're, here's the fear. We've, we've been grafted in. We've loved God. We've helped the, the, the Jewish nation. But, I mean, now it's like, we don't care who you are. We don't like you. We don't want your Bible. We don't believe there's a God out there. Woo. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail, severity. But toward thee, goodness, and here is the biggest word in the Bible, I-F. But toward thee, goodness, and notice this, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. America does not have a done deal. No nation, no people has a done deal. The only way we make it is, is if we live for God day by day. That's our business. That's our hope. And that's the joy. So here it is showing that he's going to bring them back. He's going to renew them. There's going to be a renewal. Uh, but in, in the scriptures, he's talking about that he's going to be like a shepherd. He wants them. He loves the Jewish people. Of course he does. Because he made the promise to them. He brought them out of Egyptian bondage. And now he's fished them and hunted them. Out of every nation, even drug them out of the holes. It says, go home to Israel. <laughs> Woo! And so the mindset of the Jewish people that scattered all over the world is, I need to go home. I need to go back where our nation was born. I need to go back. There might be a temple there one of these days. Wow. Interesting. So here we are. Uh, we, we looked at for just a little bit. The, the first thought out of this passage is that the Lord will be the people's shepherd. And if you know anything about a real shepherd, he's, what does he say? What does a shepherd do if, if the sheep have trouble? Yeah. What, whatever, whatever problem they've got, he's going to be there. In fact, he says, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So you talk about having a shepherd. I, I still, you know, when I think about Calvary and the cross, I, I, can't, I can't put all that into my mind why God would give his son for us. That's so, that's so awesome. Woo! But he did, and he's doing us like this, and he said, come on here. Let, let me help you while there's time, while there's opportunity. Come on, let's make it. And so that's what he's doing to Israel. He's trying to bring them back to a place that they'll recognize we need Jesus. Wow. They say right now you can talk about God, Jehovah and all that, but you can't, you can't talk about Jesus Christ. And if you tell a child about that, they put you in jail for two years. That's wild, ain't it? Connie, some, I don't know, it's been a couple of years ago, she had a, a clock that uh, needed to be fixed and a guy come down from Lubbock that was a, was he a Jew, Mom? Or had he, he had lived in Israel. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but he had lived in Israel. And I said, well, aren't you scared of, of the Islamic uh, people and their belief over there? He said, oh, no. He said, I'm not scared of them. He said, the ones I'm scared of is them Jews because they kill. Yeah, that, that, that's what the Jews, their business is. I mean, if you live by the law, the old Mosaic law, what is it? What do they do to you if they catch you in adultery? They stone you. Yeah, that's why. He said, he said that, that, them Jews ones I'm scared of. <laughs> I thought, I, I never thought of it like that. But, you know, under the Mosaic law, boy, every, everything was dealt with with death. They killed you. Now, Brother Ross made it over there and back. I don't know what, how much hide they knocked off of him. Yeah. So they're, they're fighting. They're fighting all the time. Yeah. Because that's money. Well, I know, but they obviously know they're there because of Jesus. So they, it's okay for them to talk about it between themselves. They just want you. To, they just don't want you talking to their people oh, about it. Okay. Yeah, it's like going to Russia and taking a Bible. Is it? Mm -hmm. No. That I've always been told. I've never been there, but I've always been told if you gave them a Bible with the New Testament, they just tear it out. They don't. They don't believe in the New Testament, but they they do believe the Old Testament. So. Anyway, when, when you look at all that and how, how God, he's, aren't you proud he's got a plan for us? Woo! He wants to be the shepherd. The shepherd, the good shepherd, uh, giveth his life for the sheep. Here, I think this is in, uh, in St. John chapter 10 and verse number 11. 
St. John chapter 10 and verse number 11. Thank you, Sharonda, for working on that. <laughs> that electronic device that needs a whooping whop. <laughs> I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, even even for the Jewish people, of course. He died for them too. And, and lots of Jews got saved. The nation as a whole didn't, but there's, you know, the, the early church was a mainly Jewish church, but they were led by the apostles that went with Jesus Christ. It's, it's not till you get down to chapter 10 of Acts that you see the Gentile church born. But anyway, so interesting and precious. Okay, he's, so he's going to be our shepherd. We'll look at another scripture here. Um, <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, or our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Wow. So he's talking to us in terms, they, they've been herding sheep for, since forever. In fact, whenever they came from Canaan into Egypt, what did Joseph tell them? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. He said to tell them that you're shepherds because then they'll have to put you where the flocks are. And the flocks are in the land of Goshen. And that's the best, that's the best land in all of Egypt. He says, because the Egyptians, they hate shepherds. <laughs> they loathe them. They won't eat in the same room with them. And he said, that's good. Go to the land of Goshen. It's the best land in all, <laughs> all of Egypt. That's pretty crazy, ain't it? Nope. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Look at verse 21. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Work it in you, that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. And ever, amen. So, boy, you talk about a plan. I mean, he's got a plan. You can't say John 3.16 and think about it without knowing that this was talked about a way back there. If you, if you go to, uh, what is it? Is it Ephesians? Is it Ephesians chapter 1? Look, look at Ephesians chapter 1 about verse number 3. <clears throat> it's either Ephesians chapter 1 or Galatians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Look at the next verse. <clears throat> According as he hath chosen us in him. Can you believe this? Before the foundation of the world. And so them fishers have been out there a long time and them hunters. He's been looking for people to come because he said, before the world was ever built, they already set up this shepherd, this great shepherd. And so whenever God says, hey, who will go for me and give their body? And Jesus said, I will. I will go. Woo! We got us a good shepherd, a loving Savior. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. And without blame before him in love. He set this up before he built the world. Woo! What a savior. The song says, hallelujah. Man, great shepherd, great Lord, wonderful savior. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. I like this word, by lively hope. You know, some people hope in, some, in stuff that's completely impossible. They just, I hope I, I, hope I get a million dollars or whatever. I mean, you know, live their whole life. They're, they're living off of the, you know. But there is a real hope in him, a lively one. There's nobody that can't be born again. Isn't that wonderful? Lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Man, every time I see these scriptures, I'm thinking about Easter's here on this resurrection time. I mean, it's just melted into all of the business. Verse number four. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. 
who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation to be revealed at the last time. So man, the Lord's reached a way out there. He wants to help us. He loves us. He's shepherding us. Even though we cannot see him, we know he's there all the time. What's the promise? I will never do what? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Yea, I am with you. How often? So I'm with you always. Always. Does he know the world's going to end? Oh, yes. But he says, guess what? I am going to be there with you even to the end of the world. Wow. We might just need to stop and pray right quick. They told me earlier, I hope he did, that uh, Diane Freeman was really had taken a, a turn for the worse, wasn't doing well. Her husband was here with us Sunday night. Uh, Sam, uh, they're from Gale. Let, let's pray for her right now. They said they called hospice in. How many knows that God's our great God? There's nothing that goes beyond him. Savior, we need you, Shepherd Jesus. We need you, our great shepherd that loves. Lord, touch Brother Freeman today, his wife, Diane, Lord. Cancer all over her body, Lord. That's, that's nothing to you. I know that, Lord. It may be her time to go home, but if not, Lord, touch her body, set her free from this stuff, let her be completely renewed. And if it is her time, Lord, with your arms outstretched, Lord, welcome her up into glory. Touch Brother Freeman during this time, Lord. I know his, his heart's been heavy, God, but would you touch and minister, pour into his life fresh today, Thank you for the anointing and thank you for your healing virtue and thank you that you never leave us. You never forsake us, forsake us, but yea, you're with us always, even to the end of the world. Thank you, Lord. The physical end of the world may not come during our lifetime, but our world will end one day. All of us, if, if, the, if the Lord tarries, <clears throat> death is a prominent figure that all of us face. But guess who's with us at the end of our world? Jesus, the good shepherd. And he's not afraid of the grave. He's not afraid of death. And boy, you talk about giving you hope to pass into eternity and know that he's standing right there. And all of a sudden, the Jesus you ain't been seeing, your eyes is on him. I love that song that we shall see Jesus just as they saw him. There is no greater promise than this. We're going to get to see him, Sister Jean. Won't it be wonderful? Woo! Hallelujah. Good go. Amen. Here's another passage of scripture about our shepherd in First First Peter chapter two, verse number twenty-four. Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. Here is where the innocent stood in for the guilty, that we, being dead in sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. That's past tense. It's done. Look at verse 25. For ye were as sheep going astray. Bunch of goats. We've all been there. Goated out. We had a missionary several years ago. She come and she played a little guitar. And uh, we Connie was having class. It was in our old church. She was having class upstairs for all the kids. And uh, you remember the song she sang? Yeah, <laughs> she whooped that. I never forgot. I can't get away. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. Because the goats have no hope. Nope. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. I just want to be a sheep. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I never forgot. I want to be a sheep because the sheep have hope. <laughs> no hope for the goat, but the sheep have hope. Did you know Jesus in uh, Matthew 25? He said he's going to do something. He's going to look at the nations and he's going to do like a shepherd. And he's going to, what's he going to do? Separate. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And guess where the goats go? On the left hand. The goats go on the left hand. The sheep on the right hand. A lot of church people in that sort. Because they said, Lord, we, we, we known, we've known you all this time. I said, oh no, you missed. Woo! 
I want to be on that right side. Yes. Okay. In Psalm chapter 5, verse number uh, verse number let me see if I can find it. Psalm chapter 5 and verse number 2, 3, and 4. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. He's talking to somebody who's going to help you. <laughs> I'm going to the Lord. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. So he's not going to dirty the sheep. He's going to keep them. He's going to help them stay clean. And he walks before us getting all that done in our spirits. In Psalm chapter 23, verses 1 and 2, you can probably quote the first part of that. The Lord is what? Is the Lord is my shepherd. Wow. Look at that next word. If he's my shepherd, guess what? I don't want. He's taking care of me. He makes me to lie down by the, in the green pastures. Is he talking about this actually green grass? Or is he talking about the green grass meaning that whatever we need, that's what we're going to have? Yeah. Whatever we need, that's what we're going to have. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. So he said, eat all you want and drink all you want. There's plenty. Whatever you need, there's going to be plenty of it. Woo! Man. I was thinking about Connie whenever she had a surgery years ago with just young kids. Been pastoring for, I don't know, maybe a year or two. And she had a, her thyroid uh, went went kind of, I don't know, crazy, I guess. Anyway, uh, they said that it's overactive and it was making her heart beat real bad at night. Uh, I mean, it's like you had you was running, you know. Her, well, she'd be there and there sleeping, her heart would be going boom, 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 boom. And they said, your heart can't stand that. Your body can't stand it. Something's got to be done. So we prayed and waited and uh, she didn't get her healing. So we went to the, the doctor and I, I remember everything real good as I walked, I mean, I walked down right to the emergency room. I mean, not the emergency room, but to the surgery uh, room with her. And when she went through there and I, I couldn't go no further, um, it, it was like, uh, Lord, I, I just, I don't know what to do. But you know what? The Lord come and help me. And he, he, is our, he is our guide and our hope, and, and we can rejoice because of him. He, I mean, whenever tough times come, and they do, he knows that. He's our shepherd. He leads us in places uh, past our finding out. He knows what to do with us. He helps us during those down times. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11, I guess it talks about the sheep eating because, Brother Holloway, you didn't eat today, I don't guess. Oh, just one time? <laughs> Two? I can't believe. Did he eat all day? He started at morning and ate till lunch, and then uh, the second time he started at lunch and ate on till. Oh, oh he's going to eat when he gets home. Ah! <laughs> I knew it was there somewhere. <laughs> you know what? I kind of throw in there with you. I'm kind of the same deal. <laughs> Look what the Bible says about when the Lord's leading his flock, what happens? He shall feed his flock, how? Like a shepherd. What he's saying, man, what you get from God's going to be good. He's going to fill you up, good measure, press down, shaken together. He shall gather land with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Every once in a while when we was feeding the ewes, which is a mother lamb, I mean, the mother sheep. Some of them would have two babies. In fact, a lot of them would have two babies, and and they're 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 so tiny when they're first born. I mean, it's it's, uh, it's amazing that any of them live. They don't all live. I mean, hawks catch them and coyotes and everything else. But anyway, uh, every once in a while, when we would feed, and the and the mamas would eat and then take off, one of those lambs would get confused. Well, the mamas got one lamb with her. And so she takes off, and the other one, the second one, don't know, he don't know where to go. He don't know who his mama is. There's 350 uh, mamas there, and so he, he's running up and down the cake line, and he knows where his mama was, but he, she's gone. And so I, every once in a while, I'd pick one up, you know, the early part, just the early part of the, I mean, after they get a little age on them, you know, three or four days or five, they, 
the mamas, if they got one lamb, they know they've got two. They'll go back and pick that baby up and start calling for him, and he understands. But anyway, I, I took uh, two or three of those home over the, that year the, of those, those out of the pastures, you know, where this big pasture. Anyway, Connie would take them, man. I mean, it wasn't long. They'd follow her around everywhere, <laughs> wanting to burr at the door. They would say, Where's the man? <laughs> okay. Maybe you walked outside, not me, but her. They'd just flog her. <laughs> she, you know, she had that bottle full of milk. Man, so you know the Lord, he looks at us and he says, if you're hungry, guess what? What does he want to do? He wants to feed us. He wants to fill us up to where we, we don't get, uh, when you don't get to eat, you get, you get weak. <laughs> we got to have food, Mama. <laughs> and the Lord knows that we need spiritual food too, doesn't he? Woo! It fills up with the word. Good stuff. Okay, another thing he talks about here in this passage, this is, this is uh, in verse number 13. This is Micah, chapter 2, verse number 13. The breaker is come up before them. If, if you've read much of the history, when, when you, uh, one of the men that, that released Israel the king over the Assyrians, the Lord talked to him and he says, you don't know me, but I know you. And I want you not only to let my people go, but I want you to rebuild my temple. And so he calls Israel's leaders in and says, God's talked to me. Yeah. And I, and I want you to go and rebuild the temple. He talked to me about it. He said, why should me, my family, and my children be in danger of judgment? Because we won't help y'all. We're going to help you. It, isn't that amazing? How does that happen? That's God reaching out. The breaker had come up before them. And they have broken up and have passed through the gate. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Both, both of those men was part of this breakage. Uh, look at Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, friend, I tell you what, that makes a hair stand up on the back of my neck. You know why? You think God is not in control? Whoa! The good shepherd said, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to break, I'm going to break the doors open, and you're going to get to go home. Wow. Look at the next verse. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, this is, this is like somebody from Iraq or Iran or something said, Woo! We don't want to put our hands against what God is doing. Wow. The breaker has come, and he started opening up a way. You remember the passages over in Revelation where he says, I am he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and I am he that shuts, and no man can open it. For 70 years, the door's completely closed, but all of a sudden, Cyrus says, God has spoken to me. This is a foreign culture. Woo! Talking, talking to him, loving on him. If I'm not mistaken, he's this is he is a, a, a king of Persia, and he's in Iran. What what we know as Iran or, or as Iran right now isn't that isn't that wild that the Lord used that man to open up a way and say, "Go build the temple. Take what you want to with you. I'll give you gold and silver, and plus I'm going to dig up those precious things that come from y'all's temple. We still have them." They're, they're back there in the treasure house. I'm going to give them up, and I'm going to give them to Ezra, and he's going to take them back and put them in the temple that you're going to build. Woo! 
powerful. And so the, these words in Micah have real strong meaning when he promises, even though it was going to be 70 years, his promises are good. What he says is, yeah, and amen. It's been a long time that we've heard about the coming of the Lord. But friends, we cannot be too far from it when it's almost 2,000 years from where Jesus was crucified till now. And whenever that gets there, I don't know about the Jewish calendar, just exactly where it's at, but when it gets there, Jesus is coming back for his church. And so we want to be ready. Amen. So the, the, the promise was... Uh, We'll look at one more scripture before we let the kids give their scriptures here this evening. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If that's all there was in that scripture, that would mean nobody goes to heaven. But notice this next word being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We have hope because of the breaker. The breaker has come. He's opened up the way. He's made a way where there seems to be no way. Amen. Okay.